I know this is obvious, and at the risk of stating the obvious, if the, just in case there's anybody here who's missed it, I am a marathon runner. <laughs> it's not that funny. But a long time ago, when I was in my mid-30s, uh, I did run marathons. I, I ran, I lived in Manhattan, and I ran at least an hour a day. I ran 50, 60, 70 miles a week, every week. I ran three, mile, uh, three marathons, including the 1980 New York City Marathon that I finished in three minutes, 57 seconds, and 14 seconds. Three, mi three hours, 57 minutes, and 14 <laughs> seconds, but who's counting? And at that time, I lived in a, in a New York City high-rise, and I would be going up and down all the time in the elevator in my gym shorts, and I had one neighbor one day who said, um, is it true you're going to live longer than me? And I said, no, it's only going to seem longer. <laughs> because I hated running. I, would, I did not run for the joy of running. I ran to eat. I'd always struggled with my weight, so running enabled me to eat as much as I wanted to. And it worked. I was losing weight. And the more weight I lost, the more obsessed I got, not only with running, but with what foods I ate. So I would still eat uncontrolled amounts of food, but I started to obsess about what I would put in me. And I got down, by the way, to 135 pounds at this time. And I think I was bordering on exercise anorexia. But I would eat lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains, small quantities of animal protein, cheese, white meat chicken without skin, fish, always baked, never broiled. I mean, always baked or broiled, never fried. And I would not eat a single grain of sugar, a single drop of honey, a single pinch of processed flour. I mean, I got obsessive about it. I would read every grocery la label, and I taught myself to cook so that I could make some of my favorite foods and make sure they had only whole grains and none of that, none of that other stuff that I ate, that I didn't eat. All right, around that time, I was working at Mobile Oil, eight block walk from my home, and I had a secretary. We still had secretaries in those days. Her name was Daisy Rivera. All the women in her family were named for flowers. And she was only a few years older than me. She was like in her early 40s, but it became her mission to get me to loosen up. And she thought she could maybe like sneak stuff by my defenses, like, oh, look at this nice chocolate chip cookie that Sue baked, and you know, kind of shove it toward me. And all it succeeded in doing was, was royally pissing me off because this was my body, this was my answer to, the li to life, this is how I wanted to live my life, I didn't want anybody screwing with it, and it really pissed me off. Now, oh, and, and every year before Christmas, she would bake me this huge casserole in a dis disposable casserole, casserole dish of a Puerto Rican specialty. And I remember one year, it was calamari and su tinta, and I took it home and I very carefully pulled out the, the squid and brushed off every, every single bit of rice, of non-brown rice that might be on it and, and ate it. Now, Daisy had had breast cancer and she'd had a mastectomy. And while she was working for me, the cancer metastasized to her bones and eventually spread throughout her body. But she managed to take what was probably like a six month prognosis and turn it into three or four more years of life. And she did that with little goals. So she had, uh, she wanted to live long enough to see her son graduate from high school, and she did. She wanted to live long enough to see her daughter married, and she did. And she was very devoted to her job, so she would schedule her chemo for Friday afternoons so she could be sick all weekend and be ready to work at 9 a.m. Monday morning. I remember one day I visited her at home after she'd been in the hospital and she had terrible pain in her legs from the bone cancer. And she told me that she had been practicing 
getting to the flushing elevated line and practicing walking the stairs so she could get back to work. And I thought she wasn't going to make it, but she did that time. So somewhere in the last year or so of her life, we had some changes at work. And I moved to a different section, and she was no longer my secretary. But one day, I got to work, and I'm standing outside my office. And down the hall, heading straight toward me, comes Daisy. And in her hands, in front of her, is a box of Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> And I see her coming, and I'm just getting more and more pissed. As she, she's heading right for me. <laughs> and I'm ready to say, Daisy, this is ridiculous. Will you cut it out? You know I won't eat that crap. And she comes up to me, and as I'm opening my mouth to say that, and she gets up to me, she says, Mel, would you have a donut to help me celebrate my birthday? And I was stuck. <laughs> there was no way that I could turn that donut down. And I took it, and I ate it, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> I amazed myself by enjoying it. So I doubt very much that I was an important enough figure in Daisy's life to be high on her bucket list, list of achievements before she died. But wherever I was on that list, she could now check off the little item that said, taught Mel to loosen up. <laughs>